So thank you, Todd, for being here. I know you have a lot going on with the film opening on Friday and trying to get the next film off the ground, but I you know, really appreciate you taking thank the time you, Dennis, to be so here. Thank you, Dennis, so much. Clark. It's a, such a privilege to be here. I'm so excited about the retrospective and to be at Lincoln Center. Thanks for coming, you guys. So I think we're going to start um, with some questions about Carol, um, open it up to you, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about the retrospective and about Lovers and Lollipops, which hopefully you all are staying for. Um, so I'll, I'll just ask you a few questions about Carol. Uh, for me, one of the, I think one of the most interesting things about your films is um, just the process of watching your films, at least for the first time, is trying to um, situate yourself in relationship to the film in, so in a way of trying to measure your distance from the story, from the characters. Um, and I feel like Carol does something different with that. I don't know if you, you see it that way or whether you, you, you thought about that. The process of trying to you know, identify with characters, which is quite different in your other films, I think, with, compared to Carol. Makes me want to know more about what's <laughs> what, what you're <laughs> thinking. Um, well, yeah, I um, y y Carol is the f really the the only film I've directed so far that I didn't write the script to for, and which sort of came to me in a very shiny package with this extraordinary novel that it's based on, The Price of Salt, and Kate Blanchett already attached to play Carol and a very, very long history of it trying to come together. Um, so I was immediately, and, and even Sandy Powell, the costume designer attached to it. So it was a, you know, it <laughs> grabbed my attention, obviously. Um, but what the novel made me think about and the script, Phyllis Naj's draft that I read when it, when it came to me in the middle of the year in 2013, was um, really just, you know, great love stories on film. And uh, I immediately thought of Brief Encounter. For people who know Brief Encounter, the David Lean film written by Noel Coward, it, it uh, describes a sort of a ruptured, a, a, a rupture in the lives of two married people who meet and fall in love and a sort of unconsummated, sort of somewhat repressed uh, little English uh, middle class story that ultimately becomes the story of Celia Johnson, the female character, and ex uh, depicted through her point of view. And it just made me think about how great love stories on film uh, privilege the point of view of the more, um, of the more vulnerable partner in the relationship. And often that's women in many of the films I was thinking about. And, uh, and that was definitely true for The Price of Salt, which is completely locked inside the, the mental state, the subjectivity of Therese, the Rooney Mara character in the movie. And, um, and I just found that to be, so for me it was an opportunity to explore the love story in a way that I felt like I really hadn't done in movies. But when you ask questions about um, how the viewer is situated or how you find yourself, your proximity to the material and the sort of the emotional invitation into the story, um, it was stuff I was thinking about in a different way than Far From Heaven, for instance, which I get asked about in relation to Carol because it's another film set in the 1950s with a gay theme in the story. Um, and what I loved about Brief Encounter is that it, it explicitly sets up the sort of question of whose story is this through this sort of almost MacGuffin or detour in the beginning of the film, which we uh, liberally adopted for, that I brought to the script of Carol, where you're in a refreshment stand in a train station and you're introduced to these secondary characters talking and cockney and la yapping away. And you see Trevor Howard and Celia Johnson in the background having a conversation. And you kind of go, oh, aren't they the stars? So that's what you were going for with the opening sequence? Yes. Like the starting with the... Uh, with the interrupted the crowd, conversation yeah. that then the whole right. film takes you around to exploring. But then it sets up the question, whose fi story is this? and you go through a few different missteps before you get to the fact that it's Celia Johnson's story. Right. 
Can you actually say a little bit more about the opening opening sequence? I think it's it's interesting that it um, you know you you start with like a crowd of people and then you follow a man, and to and then you know you see these two women, um, but then I think the film then obviously leaves the male point of view behind. I mean the question right. of whose story it is and, and, and point of view is is I think very interesting in in, in Carol. Well, yes, exactly, and, and it was sort of through this little relay right. of of a character who you think it might be the the story of, and then it ultimately is not, and you, and then you you see these women and they are revealed to be, and you know it's Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara, but um, but then you may not know who are we going to, and whose you know, experience are we going, right. who's going to carry us through the film, and that becomes Rooney's, Therese's character. But what I liked about what we did, what I thought was interesting about adopting that as a framework for the script of Carol is that that chain, you go through the whole course of the story, you understand what that conversation was, its import, its intense meaning in the story of this relationship, and we come back to it by the end. But by that point, the, the roles have switched, and the vulnerable person, the person who is exposed, who's liable to be hurt and rejected, is now Carol. And so you, you sort of take in the whole film to get to that point and come back around from the other side. Right. So as you just said, this is you know, the, your first film that you didn't originate, didn't write. Um, and was, did that affect the way you worked on it significantly? Did that, did that change it in any way? It didn't really. I mean, um, for one thing, I felt that there were things, there was some time I wanted to spend with Phyllis on the script, and I worked on a draft myself, and we had a good working relationship. I felt when I first read her, her, her first draft that there was something, and, and, and she immediately agreed with me when I talked to her about it, that had been sort of defanged a little bit mm. in her treatment of the novel. The novel has such great disquiet and um, anxiety between the two women. And in the script, the first draft I read, there was a, a kind of a congeniality between them right away. Right. And it, see, it felt like this has been adjusted for financiers. This had been eased <laughs> along the long, arduous process of trying to get it made. And when I talked to Phyllis about that tension and that disquiet, she was like, yes, great, let's get that back in the script. And there were a couple other things from the book that I thought were, were really lovely that I wanted to put back in. But the biggest change really was that structural change, because the book is completely a linear story, and this, the first draft of the script was as well. Um, can you say a bit about I mean, I don't, how you feel about, I, I know you didn't write the script, or you know, that, that was Phyllis's, but um, Highsmith and what she means to you. I think one thing that it actually just occurred to me, like that you're, among other things, um, your relationship to literature is actually very interesting in terms of the, the writers you've engaged with, from Genet to Rambo to James M. Cain, and how does Highsmith fit in with, with that? Well, she wasn't <coughs> necessarily somebody I felt that familiar with or, you know, like uh, intensely knowledgeable of. I started to catch up on a lot of her. I, I really just had little tales of misogyny around my house before this came to me, and I did not know uh, the, tr the Price of Salt. Um, and then I read a bunch of her novels when I took this on. And, but you know, uh, the, ama the fascinating thing about Highsmith, I think, or for me at least, and, and especially how the Price of Salt figures in distinction from this in many interesting ways, is her interest in it's almost like Eve Sedgwick Kalowski, like this interest in male homosexuality as a subtext for her imagination and her criminal subjects and how, it, I mean, Strangers on a Train, but certainly in all the Ripley books as well and many of her other novels, crime and criminality almost becomes a way in which, you know, barely covert homoeroticism is functioning as a sort of struck as a sort of tension through the stories and um, and the whole notion of the sort of pathological m mind of of both Ripley and of Bruno in 
the Bruno character in Strangers on a Train and the way that sets in, in, in Hitchcock's hands, of course, because I knew the film better than I knew the, the novel before I read it, um, is played out in visual, you know, these m incredibly memorable moments in that film with, you know, Bruno lurking in the monuments of Washington, D.C., or the tennis game where everybody's head is following the ball back and forth, but Bruno stays completely stationary. Or maybe most interestingly, that scene where Bruno, f where Guy Haynes, his name is Haynes, first tries to go home after the murder is committed. His first wife is killed by Bruno, and he tries to go back to his apartment, and Bruno's across the street behind the gates. And it's like Guy's just about to enter his known domain and he has to, he's pulled across the street behind the iron bars and he's immediately, you know, cast behind iron bars that imprison him from normalcy just by this sort of accidental run-in with this guy. But it, 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 you know, makes homosexuality something that we are all susceptible to, that we are all we could all so easily just fall into and be criminalized accordingly. I was wondering if you could say a bit about this temporal distance, just the distance from the 1950s. Um, I think every period film, but I think mainly your films, I are, don't, they don't just say something about the period that they're depicting, but the period in which they're made. Um, this is a conversation with the contemporary moment and you know, what, what it means to make this, this story, this love story, today. Um, I think as contemporary viewers, we often, you know, by, by watching something like this, it's hard not to think about like what was changed, right. what's, <coughs> you know, what's been gained or, or maybe what's been lost. And I don't know how much that was on, on your mind. I mean, I have to say there was something, I mean, the one thing I wasn't really interested in doing was a see how far we've come or how much better things are today movie. Um, and in fact, there was something so wild and interesting about the fact that in this intensely pre-Stonewall time, especially for lesbians in this country and most of the West, Western countries, um, you know, and it's expressed so poignantly in the novel that there is no vernacular for what Therese is experiencing. There's no language. And you sort of feel like they're functioning outside language outside social systems. You know, you're in the tunnel of love where you are cast out of normal, the, the, the normal world. And she literally, literally passages in the book like, I would call it love except Carol is a woman. So it's like she keeps, there are these shards of experience that she can't collate. And there's no kind of scenario or representation that, sh that can encompass her feelings. And, you know, on the one hand, it made me think of how I felt when I was in Therese's shoes, as many of us have all been, falling in love, maybe when we're much younger, maybe not, where you feel completely um, like you are inventing a language, like no one has ever experienced this before, like you're completely at the mercy of the power of the person who you're obsessed over, and reading the signs and some you know indicators of how they feel about you. But but what's interesting about this is like it's both universal and it's intensely historically specific, because that's really true about lesbian representation at this particular time, even more than gay male representation. So it has both a very specific historical, you know. Uh, relevance and accuracy, but it also ha speaks to a feeling that we've all had, even when we don't have that historical specificity to support it. So you said the, that Kate was already attached to the film when you came on board. Can you talk about maybe just filling in the other key roles? Obviously Rooney Mara, who's extraordinary and won the prize at Cannes, and, and also Kyle Chandler. Um, I think male roles in your women's pictures are always very interesting. Um, and you talk, I, I think they're two very key roles and like really, really interesting and very nuanced, layered performances. Yeah, I, and I have to say that, you know, Patricia Highsmith is quite hard on the characters of Harge, 
the husband, and even Richard, the boyfriend in the novel. And that was something Phyllis had already complicated tremendously in her adaptation. Um, but it takes a unique actor, I think, to do a number of things that Kyle does before we even speak about Rooney, who's really the person who carries you through this film emotionally and roots you and anchors you uh, through the whole, and kind of makes all of the visual language, but Kate does as well in her performance, because they're both conducting both sides of that glass that is such a predominant aspect of the look of the film that we're so aware we're either on one side of or the other. But Kyle, for one thing, just to simply find a viable male partner for Kate Blanchett in movies, I think <laughs> is a challenge <laughs> to believe in a real relationship that a guy could s stand up on, his, on the other end. Two, you know, like a grown up, you know, like a, not a aging man with a baseball cap backwards or something, like most male actors that age. So Kyle Chandler brings that um, to it. But, but he, what's interesting is that when, you, when we enter into the story, which is a very specific sort of five month span bridging 1952, 1953, um, you, you are already aware that Harge is, is reassessing the value of Carol in his life in a way that he may never have done previously. And so the performance already is, is showing us a different Harge than even she may have ever known. And something about how he plays it makes you know both the before and the difference of the present that we're entering. And, you know, all you have to do is just see that, that expression in the, of his, I mean, there's so many great and nuanced moments in the film but in him, but the final scene in the lawyer's office when she says, you know, and we're not ugly people, Harge, and just what his face looks like in that scene is so complicated and so, you know, crushed. And you, but you also feel that possibly this person has the capability of learning and changing from this experience. Um, but I think Sarah Paulson brings something really, uh, with such economy, you know, there, was more, there were more scenes of almost everything in this movie that we trimmed and sort of distilled down, but, and there were some great scenes of Sarah's. But she leaves you with such a complicated and um, thorough, I think, depiction of this character who's quite different from Carol and quite different from Therese. Um, and her decision to make the friendship something that she commits to as an ongoing you know, value in her life with Carol, but is obviously having to negotiate all these disappointments and in, in desires that, she, that were not returned. But that scene of her driving Rooney back at the end, you know, there's something about just that moment of her looking in the rear view mirror and looking, glancing back at Therese and carrying the weight of this era on her shoulders in a way that's really uh, beautiful. Um, can you... Um, I wanted you to maybe say a bit about your collaboration with um, Ed Lockman, which goes back some, some years now. Um, Ed's actually going to come talk about Far From Heaven in the last day of the oh, retrospective. Um, Fresh from Camry Mosh. Exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, this, um, the look of the film is, is, is so specific. And I, I remember talking to you after you made Mildred Pierce and you, you told me about Saul Leiter and how right. that was, you were already, you know, that was somebody you were already discovering through Ed then. And obviously I thought immediately of yes. Leiter's work. Um, but there's also like a lot of photographers from that period you yeah. were researching. Can you say a bit more about what you were going for? Yeah, I mean, um, this is my fourth project with Ed, including Mildred Pierce. We started with Far From Heaven. Um, you know, Ed, Ed, Ed's career and his artistry and the range of directors he's worked with is, is, is you know, an, an overwhelming um, history of, of post-war film um, on both sides of the Atlantic. And, uh, um, 
and he's a real artist and he, you know, um, but we've had a great, you know, we've had, each one has sort of required a whole different vernacular and a whole different set of references and, and, um, and most of the time that's been references to specific eras of film. And that was certainly true for Far From Heaven, but that was true for I'm Not There, and that was true for Mildred, and in fact. In this, in this case, with Carol, we really were looking less at films from the early 50s. I mean, I was sort of looking around for the perfect urtext on cinema for Carol, and didn't really find it in Hollywood filmmaking. Um, and, and felt also the research of this early 50s period was, was definitely um, deepened the sort of descriptions of it that began in Highsmith um, that describe a, you know, a, a, a dis disquiet to say the least, a sense of insecurity and ambivalence and anxiety, very much the culmination of the post-war era that preceded and necessitated the change of administration in Eisenhower, but he had not yet taken office, and so the Eisenhower era really had not taken hold. And so the images that we were finding in the research, a lot of it color photography from the early 50s, um, and not just in the sort of hands of great, sort of more abstract uh, visionary photographers like Saul Leiter, but in the more some of the photojournalism and documentation that we were seeing in the hands of a lot of other photographers, and a lot of them were women, and a lot of them were working in the color medi medium. And Ruth Orkin, whose daughter is here, uh, Mary, and who, who was a partner with Morris Engel, and the two of them collaborated on the film that's following Carol tonight, uh, lovers and Lollipops. They're probably best known for the film Little Fugitive. These are docudramas shot in very low budget circumstances in New York City using real background, real locations, real people on the streets of the city, often, you know, semi, a some actors or, you know, lesser known actors in, the, in central roles, which are true, which is true for uh, Lovers and Lollipops. But they feel like documentaries from the time, except that they have incredible artistry in the framing and the visualizing of these, these times and places. Um, so all of this contributed to the look of Carol and that color process, the color process itself of still photography at the time that's in everything from Saul Leiter and Ernst Haas to Ruth Ork and Esther Bubbly, Helen Levitt, was this beautifully muted sort of soiled color palette that was, you know, a complete completely different from mold surfaces of Circean melodrama that I was looking at for Far From Heaven. Hopper was someone I, you know, I'll, it's hard to not, to not consider Hopper in any film that's set sort of, you know, you know, I mean, Hopper made his paintings in the 20s, a lot of them, the best known work, but, um, but yeah, Hopper figures in my image book for for Carol, as well as my image books for Far From Heaven. Um, that particular image of Kate, I wasn't thinking of a Hopper image. There's a shot of Rooney sitting alone in, the, well, Sarah Paulson's cleaning her nylons, her silk sto her stockings in the motel room, and Rooney is intensely crushed uh, on the drive home, and they're in a hotel room together, and it's that that great green nude of Hopper's that's so gorgeous, but that sense of isolation was definitely something I was thinking about for, for that scene in particular. The scene of Carol in, the, in, that, in, that, in that coffee shop, you know, we were shooting in Cincinnati. Cincinnati was just a gift to this film. It offered so much amazing uh, raw material, and that caf coffee shop itself had these plexiglass windows that were just burnished with age and and scratches and you know layer and we just shot through them we shot all the shots on the street that you see people moving around through the existing plexiglass windows so it was the the the, the given patina for the <laughs> for the for the scene it was amazing um what was the other specific oh audrey hepburn yeah no I, I, you know what <clears throat> we weren't thinking of audrey hepburn 
or even Jean Simmons, who I think she's even more a dead ringer for. While we were making the movie, we were just thinking of how Therese would evolve into someone influenced by Carol. And it was Rooney's own gait and posture and beauty. And, and w there were some Audrey Hepburn, I, 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 have to, I should say, there were some Audrey Hepburn photographs we looked at for the, the, the cut of the wig. But uh, it wasn't like a, a fixation. Well, I think when you just said, asked that question that way, it just made me think of this funny conversation that's so recurrent these days with young people who seem so intensely interested in the present and less interested in the past. And I, I just remember being a kid and f always feeling like I just missed it. I, I just moved to New York and it, it was cool three years ago. Or, <laughs> You know, or Bob Dylan will say, he asked like, you know, uh, who was it? It was like, a, you know, it was like uh, an expat artist, what Paris was like. He was like, I feel like I missed it in the 1960s living in Greenwich Village, but you must have felt it in Paris in the 20s, 30s. And they were like, no, we felt like we missed it. You know, it's like everyone, I always feel like, how can you ever believe that your time is superior to the past? The past is always superior to the present. <laughs> and that just creates interest in the world to feel that way, even if it's completely and totally you know, su subjective and maybe never right or, or verifiable. You know? But it just creates curiosity and interest in other people and other times and other places. You know? So I, I just feel like I get to, in the most selfish, immediate level, I get to live through these other times by directing films set in them. Um, I also think it asks something very, it asks something of, a, of the audiences to look through a frame. And it's sort of what you said about considering the present through the prism of the past. That's something that the audience can do themselves. It's not something I'm going to deliver to you, you know, in a, co in a explicit term, but something that you get to do yourself, you know, through, by looking at a frame. Um, no, I didn't worry about, <laughs> it's like a nice problem to have, right? Um, you know, the amazing thing about this performance of Kate's, I think, is that Kate, you know, is aware of her proximity to the viewer so acutely and basically has to depict Carol, the image of Carol, through the eyes of Therese and then various shades of, uh, cl of a closer proximity to the real complicated and often ambivalent woman behind that image. And, but if she wasn't aware of that, and almost always aware of where the camera is and what it's doing when it's photographing her, whose point of view is it assuming at different times in the movie, it, the film, lang the language of the movie wouldn't work. If Carol, if Kate occupied sort of two, you know, almost obsequious a relationship to the viewer, it would ruin this whole, the illusion that she holds and the power that that illusion holds over Therese as a subject, you know? That there's something inexplicable about this character. And so, so for also somebody who is always playing, in some ways, the most available character in, in the roles that she plays in films, here she is playing the object of desire through a lot of the film. And she knew how to hold back and conduct that, that trance at times. And I just think that, all the understanding where you are in the course of the story, because we're shooting out of context, and we're shooting this scene now, and that scene there, and blah, blah, blah. But she has to keep all of that in her head and, and deliver it so that the language of the film is coherent. So it's just a, and I also dig that it's like the older woman playing the object of desire. Come on. <laughs> it's great. <laughs>
did people hear the question about the gun? I guess this adage of, you know, show the gun, it goes off. And <laughs> show the gun in the first act, it goes on in the third act. Why doesn't it happen? How w And how different really was this uh, from the novel, whether, the d right. whether there were changes? And also expectations of what a Highsmith story right. would be. Uh, it's a lesbian gun in the film, so it doesn't <laughs> shoot. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> but no, it was so great about reading *The Price of Salt*. And no, it didn't. We didn't change it. it we, this is how it, how how it is in the novel. But what's so great about reading *The Price of Salt* is you realize that you know there's a direct parallel between the um, furtive, overproductive um, imagination of the criminal subject, who's usually this, who is almost always her protagonist in her movies. And you're locked inside these minds and finding the sort of almost disturbingly plausible kind of machinations of the criminal mind that we all think, oh my God, I totally, that could be me, you know, it feels so um, present, you know. But what she does so beautifully in Price of Salt is that she draws a parallel to the amorous mind and it's doing all the same things the criminal mind does it's just as overheated and just as overproductive and c some, c you know, creating scenarios and outcomes and potential, well, what if this happens and what if that happens? And there's literally, you know, there's this moment where they're describing, Therese is, is describing the experience of going through the tunnel on her way to New Jersey for the first time to visit Carol's house with Carol in the car. And she says, I wished that the tunnel would collapse on top of us and both of our bodies would be dragged out one after the next. And you're like, that is love. <laughs> but it's so unsentimental and it has the hard edge and the cold, so clear-sightedness of you know, a crime novelist. Um. It is all in those silences and the lack of dialogue and the gestures and um, and some of those moments are very clearly marked in the script and described in the script. But I think, um, but it's also I think that you know really great performances like Rooney's, which sort of conducts the way we look at both her face reading Carol and what she's seeing in Carol um, is so cognizant of the, of the sort of proportions of film as a medium and how much, um, how much trust it gives to the viewer to um, invite interpretation and that if they, she did any more it would be like, whoa, 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 you know, uh, it's indicating too much, it's telling too much. If she did any less, it would feel maybe vacant or uninteresting or unengaging. And it's just walking that really delicate line because it's also these, what I liked about the, the characters and the, and again, things that some, a couple things Phyllis had done in the script is that they were more, they had more artistic ambitions in this novel Therese was an aspiring stage designer, not an aspiring photojournalist. Her boyfriend Richard was an aspiring painter. And here they're just a little plainer. And so they don't really have the, re the, the resources or the um, you know, experience or, the, or they're not exposed to, you know, they're not exposed to any possible world of lesbians in the in, in you know they don't live in Greenwich Village they don't they don't have artistic lives and so again their limited ability to deal with what they're going through is also a factor so I just create that in and of itself creates an element of suspense as you're watching the movie um, I guess a question about the the look of the film and this um, this, this filtered aspect and um, through windows and, and so on. Well, I like how you called it filtered because that's really what we were thinking about. And that, um, 
and definitely Saul Leiter for people who do know his work um, is always interested in what gets in between you know um, him and his subjects and so a lot of it is through windows and through sort of drooping awnings and precipitation and dust on the surface of glass and all of these things and I think what all of that hopefully does and it was definitely stuff Ed and I were talking about and began in my little image book where I nerd out and collect images and you know references and stuff and really that book begins as a direct communication with Ed because um, it's mostly about the visual language of the movie but then it obviously it's relevant to the production designer Judy Becker in this film and uh, costume designer Sandy Powell <coughs> but even Kate and Rooney I think found relevance in it and they found relevance in well I should just I'll finish my thought which was just that the interest in filtering and and creating barriers between us and the objects of that we're looking at you know just reveals the the uh, predicament of looking and 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 maybe at some level stokes desire because when there's something in the way you want to get around it and you're aware of the act that you are looking when there's nothing in the way you don't have to even think about looking as a predicament but this continually puts something in between us so it is filtering but uh, but Kate and Rooney also I think participated in um, that visual language and I think that helped just in the way I was describing Kate's you know sensitivity to where the camera was and how she was being depicted um, through these filters um, that visual language was a sort of starting point for everybody involved so I wanted to um, just spend a little uh, just a little bit of time maybe talking about the rest of the retrospective which as I said in the introduction is a, is a, it's a special kind of retrospective where we're not just showing Todd's films but Todd is actually selected um, very lovingly um, a series of films to show with each one um, and it was actually a really a really fun process it was, which working you were key in. with you on this and um, should we maybe say a little bit I, I, people should come back on Friday to see safe uh, Todd will be here for that and then we're going to show imitation of life which Todd will introduce and on Saturday we're showing Dotty gets spanked and a film that we will not name and uh, with you, and then well, and and you really have to see Todd introducing Beyond the Valley of the Dolls <laughs> on Saturday. Um, but uh, there's m many really fun uh, pairings through the rest of. Do you want to talk a little bit about how this, your thinking as we were putting these together? Well, you know, it was obviously I sort of started thinking of specific because it was pairing two specific films of mine and. There was a lot of films that I would watch, as you can tell in our talking, that uh, inspire um, the different films that I made and have sp sometimes extremely direct, uh, a direct role in that, like in Far From Heaven, which is so um, focused on the work of Douglas Sirk. Um, but Sometimes it was almost like too direct, like right. to show. And we didn't want to show Cirque. I know. Well, you were having a, you were having. We are actually having a full Cirque retrospective, right. not full, but very big. Which one. Which totally ruined my whole retrospective. But we are showing Imitation of Life, not with the most obvious. I mean, I exactly. love sh love showing it. The idea of showing Imitation of Life In with any Safe context, is well, but with Safe is really good. We should save that for a Friday. All right. But, uh, okay. <laughs> but no, I had to show a Cirque film, even if it wasn't the most. Uh, maybe obvious example, which would be far, All That Heaven Allows, with Far From Heaven, or, and then maybe adding Ali Furies the Soul by Fassbender, all three of those films, well, Fassbender's film first, and then many years later, Far From Heaven were. We did that when we did, had a Fassbender retrospective here last year. Oh we yeah, that's showed, right, that's right. You we showed, showed um, in sequence, um, All That Heaven Allows, right. Ali and Far From Heaven. Right, and a, a lot of. Film, yeah. Film teachers do the same <laughs> thing, um, so I'm very proud to be in that <laughs> that that link. Was link. What's great about seeing all of these together is also how the films have multiple resonances right. in like different directions right. that are sort of unexpected. Yeah. Um, I maybe one pairing I really love 
is the Far From Heaven Reckless Moment yeah. pairing. Do you want yeah. maybe just say a little bit about that and then we can talk sure. about Lovers and Lollipops? Well, Reckless Moment is a, is a real direct influence in, in a lot of aspects of Far From Heaven, but it's just a, it's a, it's a far less known movie, even in the revisionism that cert or in the sort of auteurist um, sort of st stages of auteurism that maybe discovered Cirque later than other great American Hollywood filmmaking, filmmakers. Um, but it's by Maxwell Fools, directed by Maxwell Fools, and am among his small group of films he made in the United States. And um, it's just a, um, oh, it's just one of my favorite movies uh, in the simplest way. It's just a film everybody should see. And it's just, there's not a lot of opportunities to do so. Um, and it's, uh, in some ways it's, it has an interesting resonance with Mildred Pierce, the film, because it combines melodrama and noir. Very, and, uh, and, an, and it's all about the maternal. And the, the incredible drive, to, in, in this case, to really maintain the sort of institution of family and, and maintain a sort of basic repression of the family in a, in a maternal protective mode um, while denying herself her own desires and interests depicted by the James Mason character. But the Joan Bennett performance is so contained and frenzied and, um, you know, diverted by all of the issues that arise in the story. And it's just, and visually it's so incredibly powerful in the way that what he does with that amazing floating camera um, of, of his. But uh, yeah, it, and, and, there's, and then it's fun to find the little references in Far From Heaven that, that came from um, that film. And so I'll just, I'll just tell people what else we're showing quickly. Performance with Velvet Goldmine. Mm -hmm. um, I think people can figure out <laughs> that one. <laughs> um, Mildred Pearson, Clute, not entirely obvious, although mm -hmm. I know 70s mm -hmm. American cinema was on your mind with Mildred Pierce. Mm -hmm. um, and what's... Oh. Eat the Document. Oh, yes, with I'm Not There. And Eat the Document is a very uh, little scene, rarely seen. Actually, impossible to see. Impossible. I mean, we only really see. got it with the very special occasion yes. of your retrospective. So Exactly. And Jeff Rosen, Dylan's manager, who was so kind to let us show it. Um, but it's a... It's an experimental, unlikely, incredibly um, haunting uh, piece of work that Dylan himself edited the first half hour of while recovering from the famed motorcycle accident in Woodstock in 67. Um, it's all the color footage that Penny Baker collected of Dylan during the electric year that Scorsese did, went back to the vaults of for his great longer documentary, No Direction Home. But, uh, but just the edit, it's an anti-rock concert documentary. It's just a, so it shows the periphery in, of that crazy time. Very much from Dylan's point of view. And let's not forget Assassins. Assassins, my college thesis film from Brown University. Which is showing about with <laughs> I'm Not There. Um, a nice pairing, I think. <laughs> yeah. With I'm Not There as well. It's about Rambo and Verlaine, so. <laughs> as one does in college. So um, we're, I think we're going to have to wrap this up, but I, do you, uh, you touched on Lovers and Lollipops already. Anything oh, yeah. else you want to say before people see the film? Well, Lovers and Lollipops was, uh, it, it was a discovery because I didn't know about it. And, um, but it's a film, you know, shot, I, I was really interested in shooting as much natural, evoking natural light and natural settings in New York City at this time. And, uh, but I wasn't finding great examples of that in you know, Hollywood filmmaking from the period, except for the photo, the stills I was talking about earlier. Well, Ruth Orkin and Morris Engel, as I mentioned earlier, were partners, and they made these films together. And Lovers and Lollipops, unlike Little Fugitive, which is about a little boy who runs off to Coney Island for the day, I think from 53, 54, um, this film, or maybe this is 55, it's, it's this, yeah, because it's, Mary, what did you say? It's the, 
60th anniversary of the film Nat this year. Um, this one really took place in a lot of the locations that, that are relevant to Carol, including a scene in Macy's doll floor, a toy, toy floor. And Macy's was the, it's alluded to in a scene that's not still in Carol, but it's in the novel, that Therese, uh, Macy's is the sort of step up from Frankenberg's, which is really Bloomingdale's, where Patricia Highsmith tempted for a uh, Christmas season right after she sold the rights, right after she sold Strangers on a Train to Hi Alfred Hitchcock. Um, and that's where she met this amazingly attractive older woman who walked in the store and asked for her help in buying a doll for her daughter for Christmas, and that inspired the, the book Carol and the character of Carol. But uh, Macy's was supposedly the step up, but Macy's in Lovers and Lollipops is like, it's like a disaster area. I mean, there's <laughs> trash on the floor and kids are rolling around and tired shop women and you know, and it's like, wow, and pegboard walls and Judy Becker and I were like, pegboard, yes. We're gonna put pegboard all over Carol, you know, like people are always saying, Carol is such a stylish looking film. And I'm like, what? It's like dingy and it's, you know, distressed, and I, I love that about it. I mean, Carol is stylish, and the clothes are great looking because people dressed that way in the 50s, but, but, uh, but I love the distress of it. And, um, but really, Lovers and Lollipops is so beautifully photographed. And, and the woman at the core of the story is a single mother who's trying to sort of ingratiate her daughter to her, the new man in her life. And he's a, he does a beautiful performance in that, in that role, as does the daughter. But the woman represents a kind of lost example of femininity that, you know, you don't see in actresses from the period, and we haven't seen since. Maybe you see glimmers of it in your grandmothers, you know? And it's a kind of poised, ma slightly mannered um, version of... of of a woman that, that is just like kind of a lost iconography, you know, and, I, and, and it was just so interesting to both Kate, Kate and Rooney in looking at how to build these characters who were both very different kinds of women in Carol. But this central character in Lovers and Lollipops was instrumental, I think, to that development for both actresses. Great, well, thank you, Mary Engel, again, for letting us show it. Thank you, Todd. Um, thank you. Uh, I hope you all come back on Friday and Saturday to see uh, Todd's other films. Thank you again.